Welcome to the 1834 laboratory where all kinds of experiments happen. Today we're going to be doing paint. Primer. Paint. <laughs> we are Mike and Jeannie and we restore old houses. In 2021, we moved to South Carolina and bought a 120-year-old Victorian house. Follow along as we put the polish back on this Victorian masterpiece. Welcome back to 1834 Restoration House. Thanks for stopping by everybody. We do appreciate you following us on our journey here at the old house. This place is 120 years old. And for those of you who are just stopping by for the first time, be sure and check out our other videos leading up to this. So today we have some things going on. Yes, we do. We got some new equipment. So we got to put that mm -hmm. together today. Yep. And we'll do some more paint stripping up above here on the ceiling and on the wall behind us, hopefully. But the most exciting part the most exciting part, and this is the part that I have been itching to do for weeks, is we're going to go down to the 1834 chemistry lab downstairs, and we're going to mix up some oil base historic paint. There comes a time in every restoration when you realize that you need to buy a tool because you can't get the job done without it. Well, in this particular house, that happens to be scaffolding. We have high ceilings, and a lot of work to do on those high ceilings. Our last house didn't have that problem, but we do here. So we went down and we picked up the scaffolding set and we're going to assemble it right here. There's one set. All right, two sets. Insert the braces into the side frames at desired height. Ensure that the locking stems are properly engaged into the side frames. We got the casters on, and now we're gonna put the bracing on. Got this side. How high do you want it? Let's go. Let's go through about here. Well, that didn't work. And the problem is. This side was going on just fine, but this side was too tight. Now, what I think happened was somewhere in transit, the box, because they're super heavy, probably you know, got dumped on the floor or something. And this piece most likely was on the bottom and got squished. So let's confirm that. Well, I'm seeing uh, an inch and nine sixteenths. And here I've got about an inch and a half, so. <clears throat> so clearly the side is squished in. All right. I have a pair of aircraft hand seamers here. I'm just gonna clamp onto that and just give it a pull. You know, if we're lucky, that might just open back up again. It did. Down that end. I don't know how far up you wanted it. Let's just pick a spot and see how it looks. All right. We're just picking an arbitrary point here and we'll probably end up changing it. But pull the handle, drop it in. Oh yeah. Okay, now move it that way slightly. There we go. 
Okay, there's one side done. We should have four holes showing. There we go. I'm six feet tall and we need to figure out where my head is in relation to this deck. So here's the deck. Let's go up six feet and see how that looks. There's four feet, five feet. Okay, well we topped out at five, so I would be standing like this the whole time. That wouldn't be good. So six feet. Even my head would hit the ceiling with that size. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were worried if this would be high enough, but it, it certainly is. So there's six feet right there. So I probably want a couple more inches. Um, so I'm just gonna say four inches down from that would be fine. So probably there. Now let's measure off the floor. That ends up being about, about 46 inches off the floor is where, okay. is where the, the deck should be. So let's go ahead and take one of these off. Let's move this off. Keep going. Keep going? Yep. Yeah, let's, let's set it in. Actually, if you just want to hold it there, I'll measure. Mine's locked in already, but okay. I don't know where it needs to be. All right. 46 inches. Yes. There's 47. So it looks like it will come down. One more notch? One more notch would go past it. Okay. So we can try this and see how it goes. Let's yeah, measure from this. Fairly close to the ceiling. Six feet to this part here is where the platform would be. Uh huh. So let's measure that again. So six feet from there. Yeah. Looks like there's five. There is six right there. So that's, that's my head. And uh, it gives you three inches to work with. That's perfect. All right, let's go change the perfect. other side. Check this first, please. I don't know where this one is, if it's right. So it should be, huh? Well, it wouldn't fit if it was wrong. I can't be one off? No. The, okay, the good. The twisting won't allow it. Good. I am usually one or two rings off, so that's why I was concerned. Good. Okay. So right about in here, I think. It looks right. Okay, I have four holes showing underneath this rung. Yes. Four holes showing Agreed. there. Agreed. Okay, there we go. Let's finish the assembly. Sounds good. Okay. This way. All right, put it up here. Set yours in place. It is. This scaffolding here will make easy work of a tough job. Because it's so big, I can walk back and forth freely, and I don't have to stand on the ladder and twist my body and try to do this kind of thing. It's much safer and comfortable to be able to stand on a scaffold. The only thing that I would change about this arrangement is to have some kind of a barrier across here to prevent falling off. And we could do that easily enough with uh, a piece of cabling or, um, or tape or something, just as kind of a warning, don't step or you're gonna be on the floor. Now this scaffolding has a couple of nice features. One of them is that you can buy two or three of these and stack them two or three high. So it can go a lot higher and not be a threat or a danger. And that is wonderful, although we won't need that part for this house anyway. Maybe in the future, who knows? And then we have, what is this, a trap door? No, <laughs> it's an access panel so that you can climb up to go up, up, up if you so needed that much height. And then you can close it back up so you have the full length of the entire scaffolding to walk back and forth on.
expected. And this contour tool works really nice. Good. Well, once I find the right contour. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of tricky because it keeps changing. I don't think this is going to work. I think the needs adjusting. It's not making it hot at all. It's too far away. As I work, I'm keeping a little bit of heat on the surface at all times, just to keep it warmed up. I just need to keep my hands out of the way. How are you liking the scaffolding? I love it. I don't feel like I like I don't fall off or anything. It just feels really stable and smooth. And I know that I can go several feet without having to move the ladder, and that's a huge benefit. Easier on your knees, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And the arches of the feet. Yes. Yes, this is so nice. So nice. Welcome to the 1834 Laboratory, where we do experiments of all kinds, culinary and otherwise. So today we're going to talk about paints. Now, this is the can of oil-based primer that we've used in previous episodes. But I had a viewer contact us and say, no, that's not oil-based primer. And my first thought was, well, yeah, it is. But then I took a second look, I checked the label, I checked the manufacturer's data sheet, lo and behold, there is not a drop of linseed oil in this whole thing. So, contrary to what the salesman told me, this is not linseed oil primer. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm taking this off the table, and we're going to make our own linseed primer. We have all of our materials, boiled linseed oil, pigment, measuring cup, a scale, a stirring stick, and a spoon. So the first thing I'm going to do is pour out four ounces of boiled linseed oil. Okay. Now the reason I chose four ounces is because it's divisible into 128. 128 ounces is one gallon, and ultimately we want to know how we can get to a gallon of paint. So what we're going to do is measure out this and find out how much it weighs. And then we'll multiply that by 32, and that will tell us how many grams of pigment we need to get to a gallon. Let's turn on the digital scale. We had a little bit of a problem a few minutes ago because we were testing some things, and the scale was going crazy. And we couldn't figure out why, but it was going up and down and up and down and up and down. Well, the reason is I had a radio transmitter sitting about two inches away from it, and it's a sensitive electronic instrument, so that didn't work too well. So the scale is on, I'm going to put the cup on there, and then I'm going to press the tear button. Tear means empty weight, so we've subtracted the weight of the cup, so now the scale is calibrated at zero. Let's go ahead and put some pigment in there. All right, we have about six grams right there. There.
there's about 10 grams. So let's try 10 grams and see what we get. So first we'll take that and we'll put it on our paper. All right, we'll make a little volcano out of it. Now let's take our oil and we'll take a little bit of it out and we'll just drizzle it in. And I'm going to take my popsicle stick and see if I can mix up some. What we want to do is liquefy the pigment and turn it into a paste just to get it started. Okay, it's still a little bit dry, so let's add some more oil to it. Liquefied pigment is much easier to put into oil because it's already liquefied and we can kind of crush it down and just kind of homogenize it, so to speak. Now in the beginning, this is really experimental because we don't know how much pigment we need to add in order to get the right quantity. So we may have to do this a few times until we get it right. But once we've got that and once we've measured that, then we can replicate it real easy. Okay, that's looking nice and wet, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in. Okay, so that's 10 grams of pigment and half cup of oil. So we have this nice buttery yellow <laughs> kind of a mixture here. Clearly we need more pigment in there to offset that. Now they do say that oil-based paints do tend to lean towards the yellow end of the spectrum. So if you're trying to do blues with this stuff, um, you're going to have to play some tricks with it to, to overcome the, the yellow. We have a nice mixture there, but it's still too yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and add some more pigment to it. And we'll go ahead and get the tear weight off of there. So I'm going to take a, a guess here. Okay, there's six grams. Let's maybe go for another 10 and see how that looks. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of slowly add it in while I'm stirring. It acts like it's trying to turn white. It wants to turn white, but it's still being overpowered. I'm just making sure that there are no solids on the bottom because we want everything mixed up. Okay, well that's a really beautiful shade of pale yellow right there, but that's not quite what we're looking for. So let's go ahead and put another 10 ounces in there. We'll go ahead and just add that in nice and easy while we're stirring. There was a point in time where they used to use lead paste to get that super white color. And it was really effective until they found out that it was hazardous. Okay, so we have 30 grams of titanium white here. And I'm not seeing that it's turning really white-white. It's more of a yellow-white. And the question is, is that okay? And the answer is probably yes. What we have here is a soupy mixture of linseed oil and pigment. But this we could probably put on wood right now. And if we wanted to make it a super soaker, we could add in some turpentine. I walked away from this for a few minutes and came back and I noticed that the pigments had kind of settled down low into the mixture here. And I have a vague recollection of that being the case back in the days of oil paint where they would say you need to stir frequently. So I'm going to try to brush some on here. Let's see what it does. Still 
Well, there we have it. That's a bit of linseed oil primer, the real stuff this time. It looks like it's hiding pretty well, much better than I expected. One of my concerns was pigments that aren't really in solution. And I'm seeing this, what looks like crusty stuff here, but when I push on it with the brush, it doesn't move. So I'm thinking that's probably just wood grain. I did sand these, but I didn't really sand them very well. I just kind of hit them real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and set this aside and let this dry. And I'm going to do up some more of these because the next thing we're going to do is mix up some color and I'd like to have a primed substrate to put the color coats on. I primed five boards and I'm going to mix up some other paints and then we'll put the color coats on top of these later. But I'm going to let them dry. Here's an unprimed piece of wood for comparison and here it is with the primer. So let's put the primer in the can. I'll just stir it up here, make sure everything's in suspension. And pour it in. Sure, get all of it in there. Great. So there's a half cup of primer in this can, and we'll just keep this for later, and we'll make some more of it. Let's mix up our first color batch here. Again, we'll do four ounces of boiled linseed oil. On our last batch, we used 30 grams of white. I'm not really sure how much to use of this green color, so let's try. Let's say try maybe 20 grams. Let's see how it goes. All right, I'm going to put the whole amount down here on the paper. Make myself a little volcano there. And again, the reason I'm doing this is to liquefy it and also to make sure that the pigment is completely crushed. That's making an interesting color there. Maybe it's a bit darker than I expected. The pigment keeps trying to run away every time I push on it. This is very similar to a technique that artists use when they make their own oil paints. They'll just take it and crush it. They have some kind of fancy glass, um, I don't know what they call it, but it's some fancy glass tool that they use. I'm just trying to get the grit to turn into a paste. So I'm just going to scoop this up like so. And drop it in there. This is what the pigment looks like. And this is what it looks like after it's mixed up. I put a little bit here on the paper towel when I was cleaning up. You can see that's a pretty dark green and that's way darker than what we wanted. So what I'm going to do is blend up some white and then we'll put the white into it and see if we can tone it down toward the lighter end of the spectrum. Since this is mad science, we're just basically guessing on everything. So I'm going to go ahead and put in about 10 grams of white. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and drizzle some of that oil back in there. Yes, it is green. But do we really care? Because it's all going back in the same pot. The most important part of all this is that we keep track of our measurements. So we know that we have 10 grams of white. We know that we have 20 grams of green. But knowing what those numbers are is really important because once you find the right mix, then you can just upsize it to any quantity that we need. And we'll just scoop it right into the jar. Oh, 
Okay, now that is starting to look a lot more like what we have here. It's about the same. That was the color tone that we were looking for. Kind of a dusty green. This color is really popular today for accent walls. Although, people may not realize that it's actually a historic color. Can you see the difference now? That's a dusty green and that's a deep green, kind of a, a hunter green or forest green as they call it. So I think this is a fine color right here. We don't really have any wood we can put it on yet until these dry over here. So we'll go ahead and put it in the pot and we'll wait for it. And now we'll mix up a red. Four ounces of boiled linseed oil. Wow, that is a bright red pig pigment. This is incredibly smooth and creamy. All right, the next color is yellow. It'll be kind of an earthy yellow and enhanced by the yellowness of the linseed oil. So again, four ounces. Well, this is looking a little bit darker than we had hoped for. And so we're gonna to try to add five grams of titanium white into that and see if we can take some of the edge off of it. Okay, there's our titanium white, six ounces. And we'll just take some of our yellow linseed oil and just kind of drizzle it in. And we'll go ahead and mix that up. Now we've been told that this titanium white is extremely powerful. So I hope we don't overdo it. We're getting a little bit of a color change there. It's not quite so, so deep. Um, What do you think? That's what it was. Hmm. I would say maybe four more ounces. Four more ounces? Yeah, of white. Okay. Then I'm something gonna leave in the middle. that and see how it goes. Okay. Because we've got the white primer, so maybe that's all it needs is just a little. That's true, because the white primer behind it will help to reflect the the light and mm -hmm. bring the color out more. So let's leave that, I think, and then we'll try it. Because okay. we can always add more white, but we can't take it back out. That's right. Remember that. <laughs> Those of you who have chosen paint colors for your house know the terror of looking at that color and thinking, what is that going to look like? And the fear of putting it on and, and the first few square feet you put on there just it just looks terrifying. And then once you get it done, you know, it's not that bad. Pretty soon it starts to grow on you and it starts looking pretty good. So I have a feeling that that's what's going to happen here. This looks pretty good right now, I think. So let's go ahead and put it in the can and write it up. Okay, that's four colors. Uh, we have a couple more we could play with if we want to. Remember the initial darkness of this green color here? Well, we discovered that that color is about the same color of the darker green that we were looking for originally. And we bought a darker green pigment, 
but we may be able to get away with using this pigment for the dark and the light. Well, this episode was pretty technical. A lot of chemistry, a lot of science going on here, and experimentation. But that's what it's all about, right? So we think we have some good colors here. And we're going to wait for a few days after these dry. We'll go ahead and apply those colors to the boards so we can see what they look like. And we'll do that in the next episode so you guys can see what it looks like too. So what we're thinking is, if this works out, we can use these formulas and these colors to paint this house. Last week we showed you a color scheme really quickly, but let's throw it up here again so you can see it more clearly and for a little longer period of time. So we looked at a lot of color schemes online for Victorian houses. This one here jumped out at us and said, this is the one. But that was our opinion. What do you guys think? Yeah, let us know in the comments. Thank you for watching 1834 Restoration House. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. We are so close to 10,000. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in the next video. All right. Bye, guys.